How's it going, YouTube? Since you guys saw the ugly truck last, I've put about 300 miles on it, just kind of making sure all the systems work together. And I don't like how the truck drives. Now, the chassis is great. Everything suspension-wise is brand new. And the transmission, that thing shifts great. But the one problem I do have is with the gear ratio. This thing has 342s in it, and when you combine that with the 4L80, it has pretty poor acceleration, especially from a dead stop. So today, I'm going to fix that by regearing to a 430 to 1. This will give the truck a lot more get up and go, and it'll still have a reasonable RPM when I'm cruising down the highway because it is an overdrive transmission, and I do have a little bit taller than normal tire at about 31 and a half inches tall. So I'm going to show you some of the steps that I use to set up a ring and pinion. Now, it's one of those things where a lot of people do get a little bit nervous because it is easy to mess up. You do need some special tools. And, you know, if you do it wrong, you can either burn up your gears or it'll be noisy or it'll run way too hot. Um, but I'm just going to show you some of the steps that I use. There are a lot of different ways to do it, but I've had pretty good luck. So we'll get started by tearing it down. Now, if you've never done rear end work before, it can be a little bit confusing about how this is all held together. You know, specifically the axles being held into the center of the differential. Now, this is a C-clip design, which basically means it uses a C-clip, this small C-shaped piece of metal to hold the axle from pulling out. There's a small groove that goes on the end of the axle and the C-clip just kind of engages in there. And again, it stops it from being pulled out. And this is a semi-floating axle design. Now, basically what that means is the only thing that holds the axle from pulling out of the whole rear end, you know, is this one little C-clip right here. A full floating axle actually has two bearings on the end and a nut and a retainer and all that holds the hub into place. But on a semi-floating axle, the hub is basically part of the axle. Now, it's kind of a sidebar, um, but on this style of C-clip axle, you also have to have something that stops the axle shafts from being pushed in and allowing the C-clip to fall out. And that's the job of the center pin right here. Just a round piece of metal, and there's a small bolt that goes through the end to kind of hold it in the center of the carrier. And also the spider gears, they just kind of pivot on this, which allows the whole differential action to happen. Now, this is an open differential with 342 gears, and it's all worn out and it's all garbage. So I'm really not going to be using any of this stuff, really, other than the diff cover and the axles. So our new installation starts by putting bearing races back into the housing.
So the carrier is all prepped and basically we're ready to start reassembly of this rear differential. But we can't just slap it all back in and expect it to run properly because there are a couple of critical tolerances that need to be set up in order to make this ring and pinion set live a long and happy life. And the first, and probably one of the most difficult to get, is pinion depth. Now, pinion depth is basically a measurement of how far away the face of the pinion gear is away from the center line of the carrier or the ring gear. Now, it's controlled by a pinion shim, which is a very thin piece of metal. These range anywhere in thickness between five or ten thousandths all the way up to about thirty-five or forty thousandths. And when you buy a master install kit, it comes with a whole variety of them in different thicknesses that you can stack together to achieve your final desired thickness. Now, there are two different ways, or actually several more ways, to figure out exactly how thick of a shim you need to put between the gear and the bearing. And one of the more common is, well, you use a very expensive and fancy tool that basically is a fixture for a dial indicator that bolts into the rear end housing where the carrier would normally go. It takes some measurements and you do a few simple calculations to figure out exactly how thick of a pinion shim that you're going to need. Now, I don't have one of those tools and I know a lot of you guys don't have one either. So instead I just prefer the method of trial and error by putting everything together and running a gear pattern check with that yellow paint and that'll tell you which direction you need to move things, whether you need a deeper or a shallower pinion depth. So the thing is though, you're going to have to take this pinion bearing on and off several different times because like I said, it's trial and error. And the problem is the bearing that you get in your master install kit, you have to press it onto and off of the pinion gear. And doing that several times, there's a chance that you could actually damage it, especially if you don't have the right tooling. So instead, I like to use a setup bearing, which is essentially the same exact part number and model of bearing, except the inner diameter has been sanded just a little bit to allow it to easily slide on and off of the pinion gear. So basically you put it together with the setup bearings, I also made one for the outer pinion bearing, run a pattern check, see which direction you need to move the shim, take everything back apart in, add or subtract a shim, and then put it back together and run another pattern check. And then when you finally have everything exactly where you're going to want it, you take it apart once more, and then you press on the pinion bearings one time. That way you know everything is nice and simple. So I'm not going to show you guys every last iteration of this thing going together and coming apart because basically that's going to get repetitive. Now this right here will be my third attempt and I think I'm getting very close. I keep track just on a piece of cardboard a simple chart of all the different thicknesses of shims that I put on on each step so basically I can reference that and make adjustments as need be. Now this third attempt I'm going to have 45 thousandths on the pinion shim. My last one was 35 so basically I'm going 10 thousandths more and my goal is to push the pattern just a little bit further down to the root of the gear. I'm pretty close, but just that one more adjustment I think will nail it in the ballpark. I actually wound up messing with this thing quite a few more times, making several more adjustments until I got the pattern kind of to where I was happy with it. Now I ended up going with 40 thousandths on the pinion shim and I had to mess with both of these side shims just to get the carrier to the 9 thousandths of backlash. Kind of hear that there and I measured it with a dial indicator as well. So really the question is, what movement of the pinion is going to do what or have what result on the pattern? And it's really quite simple. The deeper the pinion depth or the closer the pinion is to the carrier, well that's going to push your pattern kind of down into the valley of the gear, kind of down along the face. And the shallower the pinion depth, or the further the pinion is away from the ring gear, well that's going to raise it up kind of towards what I would call the ridge or the peak of the gear. Now the backlash is going to have a similar effect but it's going to be in and out. But you don't really do backlash by the pattern, you just do that with a dial indicator. And like so on this one, the spec is between six and ten thousandths and I'm right at nine. So now that I've got the pattern exactly where I want it, it's time to take everything apart press on the real pinion bearing with my shim still intact, and then we move on to pinion preload. Pinion 
bearing preload is the next thing that we're going to tackle and it's basically measured by how much force or drag it takes to turn the pinion bearing in the empty housing. And it's just a reflection of how far apart the two pinion bearings are from each other. As they're closer together, the more drag that you're going to have. Now that's controlled by, number one, the torque on the nut, but more importantly, this thing right here. This is called a crush collar. Basically, it sits right on the pinion and it spaces out the outer pinion bearing. And as you tighten the pinion nut, this is going to deform or crush and allow the two bearings to get just a little bit closer together. And like I said, as they get a little bit closer, they'll get a little bit tighter. Now there's a very specific measurement, not of torque of the pinion nut, but of rotational torque. And I believe on this rear end with a new set of bearings, it's somewhere between 18 to 25 inch pounds of rotational force. So. Basically, you just got to be super careful as you tighten this nut down, you know, you can use an impact, but things happen in a hurry. So if you go too far, let's say you're shooting for 20 to 25 inch pounds and you make it to 30 or 35, you can't just back off the nut. You have to start over, take the pinion out and then replace the crush collar with another one. That way you can get it the first time around because once it gets squished too far, it's not like a spring. It's not going to spring back. Now, if your carrier has too little backlash, or a little bit less than the requirement, all you need to do is shift it left or away from the pinion gear. If your carrier is too loose or has too much backlash, all you gotta do is shift it back the other way towards the pinion gear. So that pretty much wraps up the rebuild and the re-gearing of this GM 8.6 10 bolt rear differential. Now there are a couple things worth mentioning. Um, first thing, pinion bearing preload. Earlier I mentioned, I thought it was a little bit higher, 22 to 25 to 30. Actually spec for this rear end, according to the manual, 14 to 19 inch pounds. Now one thing you did not see probably too well is how I actually measured that. This right here is a little bitty beam style torque wrench basically and as you tighten it, this little needle kind of moves on the scale. It just gives you a rough idea of how much rotational drag it takes to turn the pinion. Um, next thing, if you're doing this for the first time, you're really not on your own. There are a lot of great resources out there and just about every set of gears that you get will come with some sort of a manual which has all kinds of helpful tips and tricks including acceptable and unacceptable wear patterns and what to do to change the pattern to get it exactly where you need it. So that's how to re-gear in a nutshell. And I want to say thank you guys for watching this video. Thanks for sticking with it to the end. And if you would, please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and click the like button as well. Next time, we're going to be driving this truck, but in between now and then, I'm going to fill it with lube and I'm going to break it in. I'm going to run these gears probably for three to 500 miles without going full throttle, just to kind of let everything wear in and break in. Um, read the manual when it comes to that. But as soon as this thing is broken in, you can bet we're going to be doing some burnouts.